Let's get weird into it. Number 10. The Brain's 404 Error. You're telling a great story. The kind of story that has suspense, a little bit of drama, and a killer punchline. You're leaning in. Your audience is captivated. And you're about to name the key object. The crucial person. The pivotal. The pivotal. Uh, it's gone. The word you need, a word you've used a thousand times, has suddenly been deleted from your internal dictionary. It's not just forgotten. It feels like it's been surgically removed, leaving behind a perfectly word-shaped hole in your brain. This is the tip of the tongue phenomenon, and it's basically your brain's version of a 404 not found error. The file isn't gone. You still know what the thing is. You can describe it. You can picture it. But the link to the file name is broken. The server is down. The little neural pathway that connects the concept of a thing to the sound of its name has decided to take an unscheduled lunch break. Your prefrontal cortex sent out a request, and somewhere in the temporal lobe, a tiny neurological intern tripped over a wire and unplugged the whole system. The information is there, safe and sound in storage, but your brain's search engine is just returning a frantic, blinking cursor. Your brain isn't empty. It's just incredibly disorganized, like a teenager's bedroom where the floor is technically still under there somewhere. Number 9. The Word's Ghost The truly maddening part isn't just that the word is gone. It's that you can feel its ghost. You know things about it. You can almost taste it. You'll find yourself saying things like, I know it starts with a P. Or, it has three syllables. Or, it kind of rhymes with parapet. You are holding a complete schematic of the word without having the word itself. You have its shadow, its blueprint, its entire IMDB trivia page but the star of the show has refused to come out of their trailer. Psychologists call this the bath state, not because you're likely to remember the word in the shower, but because you're bathed in the information surrounding the word. Your brain has successfully accessed all the semantic data, the meaning, the context, the connections, but the phonological data, the actual sounds that form the word, are locked in a vault. It's like trying to describe a song you love but only being able to hum the bass line and tap out the drum pattern. You have all the supporting evidence, but the main melody is nowhere to be found. You've successfully downloaded the trailer, the movie poster, and the Rotten Tomatoes score, but the actual movie file is corrupted. Number 8. The Ugly Stepsister Effect As if having a word ghost haunting you wasn't bad enough, your brain has another, even more unhelpful trick up its sleeve. While you're desperately searching for the right word, your brain will start offering you the wrong one, over and over again. You're trying to think of the word anecdote, and your mind just keeps screaming, antidote, antidote, antidote. You know it's wrong, but it's loud, it's persistent, and it's blocking the path to the word you actually want. This isn't just you being bad at remembering. It has a real and frankly perfect name, the ugly stepsister effect. In the story of Cinderella, the ugly stepsisters try to force their feet into the glass slipper, blocking the path for Cinderella, whose foot is the perfect fit. In your brain, the wrong but similar sounding word is the ugly stepsister. It's a phonological bully that keeps shoving its way to the front of the line, convinced it's the right word, while the correct word is waiting patiently to be called upon. This blocker word is so aggressive that it actually inhibits your ability to find the real one. It's not just unhelpful, it's actively malicious. Your brain is gaslighting itself. Number seven, your tongue is a liar. Let's talk about the name of this whole nightmare. The tip of the tongue phenomenon. It's such a universal feeling that the phrase exists in dozens of languages. In French, you have it on the edge of the tongue. In Italian, it's on the point of the tongue. In Latvian, it's on the end of the tongue. Everyone agrees. It feels like a physical object is literally perched on your muscle of speech, ready to be spoken, but refusing to jump off. Here's the thing though. Your tongue has absolutely nothing to do with it. Not a single thing. It's just an innocent bystander in a neurological civil war. The feeling is a type of psychosomatic sensation, a physical feeling caused by mental or emotional distress. The frustration and mental strain of the search are so intense that your brain translates that cognitive struggle into a tangible feeling. It's the same reason your stomach might churn when you're nervous. It's a purely brain-based problem that's so maddening. Your mind decides to blame a completely unrelated body part. Your tongue is just sitting there, minding its own business, trying to help you taste pizza, while your brain upstairs is setting off the fire alarms because it can't find its keys. Number six, the clumsy librarian. Imagine your memory is a massive ancient library. Every concept and word you've ever learned is a book on a shelf. When you want to retrieve a word, your prefrontal cortex, the little librarian at the front desk, 
gets the request, and sends a runner back into the stacks to grab the right book. Most of the time, this process is seamless. But sometimes, especially for a less frequently used word, the runner is a bit clumsy. On the way to the P section for pedantic, the runner gets distracted by pendant and pandemic on a nearby shelf. It trips, and suddenly an entire armful of related but incorrect books comes crashing down, blocking the aisle. This is essentially what's happening in your head. Your brain starts the search by activating a network of related neurons. The problem is, sometimes this activation spreads too far, lighting up neighboring, similar-sounding, or similarly meaning words. You end up with a pile of useless options, and the original target is buried under the mess. Your brain isn't searching, it's panicking. It's the cognitive equivalent of shaking a vending machine when your chips get stuck. Number five, your brain on low battery. Ever notice this happens more when you're tired, stressed, or have had one too many coffees and are now vibrating at the same frequency as a hummingbird? That's no coincidence. Your brain's ability to retrieve information is not a magical, infinite resource. It requires energy and focus, both of which are in short supply when you're running on fumes. Think of your cognitive function as your phone's battery life. When it's at 100%, you can run a dozen apps, stream video, and download files with no problem. Word retrieval is fast and snappy, but when you're down to 15%, the screen dims, the apps lag, and simple tasks become a struggle. Stress and fatigue are the neurological equivalent of being in low power mode. The stress hormone cortisol, in particular, is known to interfere with synaptic function in the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, the very areas responsible for memory recall. Basically, your brain is telling you to take a nap, but instead of using words, it just deletes them. Number four, the senior discount. Let's address the elephant in the room. As we get older, this brain glitch seems to get a frequent flyer pass. You start having tip of the tongue moments, not just for obscure vocabulary, but for the name of your neighbor, the title of your favorite movie, or that actor who was in that thing. It's easy to jump to the conclusion that your memory is just packing its bags and heading for retirement. And while it's true that these moments become more common with age, it's not usually a sign of serious memory decline. Researchers believe it's more about a change in the efficiency of our neural networks. Over a lifetime, you've accumulated a staggering amount of information, far more than a 20-year-old. Your brain's filing system is just more crowded. Furthermore, the connections between the semantic memory, the meaning, and the phonological memory, the sound, can weaken slightly over time, like an old cable that's gotten a bit frayed. The signal can still get through, it just takes a little longer and sometimes needs a good jiggle. It's less of a senior moment, and more of your brain's file system switching from a lightning-fast SSD to a dusty old floppy disk. Number three, proper noun amnesia. There's a special kind of cruelty reserved for forgetting proper nouns. You can see an actor's face perfectly in your mind's eye. You know they were in that sci-fi movie with the blue aliens, and also that period drama, where they wore a ridiculous hat. You know their entire filmography, but their name? It has vanished into the ether. This is because proper nouns are uniquely vulnerable to being forgotten. Words like chair or blue are embedded in a rich, dense web of associations. A chair is for sitting. It has legs. It's a piece of furniture. It can be made of wood. The word is reinforced from a dozen different angles. But a name like Benedict Cumberbatch? That's an arbitrary label. It has no intrinsic meaning. It's connected to one specific concept, that person. There's only one flimsy neural string connecting the idea of him to the sound of his name. If that one string gets misplaced, the name is gone. Your brain stores the name Benedict Cumberbatch in a tiny unlabeled box in the attic, while chair gets a whole wing in the main hall with a neon sign. Number two, the mental boomerang. So you throw your hands up, you surrender. The word is gone, your story is ruined, and you change the subject. You move on with your life. You start doing the dishes, or driving home, or staring blankly at a wall. And then, with no warning whatsoever, it happens. The word pops into your head. Obfuscate, you yell in the middle of the grocery store three hours too late. This is the mental boomerang. The moment you stop consciously, frantically searching for the word, is the moment your brain can actually find it. Your intense, focused effort was actually creating cognitive interference like a panicky crowd blocking the paramedics from reaching the patient. When you relax and shift your attention, you allow your brain's passive background processes to take over. This is called spreading activation. The initial spark of the search is still glowing, and it slowly, quietly spreads through your neural network until it bumps into the right connection. Your brain needed you to get out of the way so it could actually do its job. 
It's the ultimate let me do it moment, but from your own subconscious. Number one, lethologica. This whole agonizing, embarrassing, soul-crushing experience has a name, and it's a fantastically dramatic one. Lethologica. It comes from two Greek roots, lethe, which means forgetfulness, and logos, which means word. But it gets better. In Greek mythology, the lethe is one of the five rivers of the underworld. Souls of the dead would drink from it to forget their past life before being reincarnated. So, when you're experiencing lethologica, you're not just having a minor brain fart. You are, in a mythological sense, having a word in your head take a brief, refreshing dip in the river of oblivion. It's temporarily forgotten its own existence. This is the perfect label for a phenomenon that feels so profound. It's a common, harmless, and completely normal glitch in the wet, messy hardware we all have running in our skulls. So the next time you can't remember the word for that spiky green vegetable, just remember, you don't have a broken brain. You're just taking a brief, involuntary tour of Greek mythology. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.